So if we look at the um, the 802.11 frame format, uh, we have, uh, if I get my mouse point here, okay. So we have the address one and address two. Uh, we also have address three and four. Uh, so the, the addresses are 48 bits each because they're ethernet uh, style addresses. We can have up to uh, 2,312 bytes. We have a 32-bit CRC, quite like Ethernet, uh, and a 16-bit control field, um, which has a number of subfields that are uh, of interest to us here at this point. So one is a 6-bit type field. So this is how we can tell whether a frame is going to be a CTS frame or an RTS frame or a data frame or used uh, for beacons and the like. Um, there's also two one-bit fields, 2DS and from DS. So DS is distribution system here. Uh, so again, we have those four addresses. So the way that they are used depends on the values of the <coughs> 2DS and from DS bits. So essentially we can handle, uh, with because there are these four addresses and the two bits, we can indicate whether a frame is going directly from a client to an access point or vice versa, um, or whether the frame needs to go um, to the distribution system or, needs, or has come from the distribution system, therefore shouldn't be able to be looped uh, back around. Uh, so, in other words, if the um, uh, if a node has moved uh, in the network, uh, this helps us to track that uh, to some degree. So, if, for example, we have uh, the just a regular one node sending directly to another, without using the, any distribution system uh, between them, uh, both the DS bits will be zero. So, two DS and from DS will both be zero. Um, address one identifies the target node. So similar to ethernet, destination address comes first to speed up uh, switching uh, and forwarding and address two identifies uh, the source node. Um, in comparison, if both bits are set as the most uh, complicated uh, situation, this means that a message went from a wireless node through the distribution system uh, and then from the distribution system, it's come back out at another uh, wireless node. So address one still identifies the, uh, the ultimate destination. Um, address two is who it most recently came from. Um, address, so that's the uh, the one that forwarded the frame uh, on. So the most recent node that has forwarded the frame. Address three identifies the intermediate destination. So this is where the frame uh, should, uh, or where the frame next went to. And address four identifies the original source. So if, for example, we had um, if we come back to here. So if E is communicating with A, so E goes to access point three, access point three goes to access point one, access point one goes to A. So now if we have a look at that, so address one is E. So this is the, um, sorry, we're going from A to E, sorry, not um, E to A. So the ultimate destination is node E. Address two was the immediate sender to E, which is the access point it's connected to, which is access point three. Address three was the intermediate destination. So that's the destination that the original sender sent the frame to. And of course, the fourth address is the original source. So we know exactly the path that uh, the frame has taken uh, to get from A to E. And as a result, the network can make sure we don't get loops and all those sorts of uh, tricky things. Okay, so moving on from Wi-Fi uh, to Bluetooth. So Bluetooth is used and was intended for quite different purposes. So it still operates in the same band as Wi-Fi. So there's actually a mutual interference thing that has to be looked after when you're making laptops and phones and the like. Um, it was designed to have very short range communication, really for personal area networks. So it was designed for you know for headsets and, and those sorts of things. Um, and so the intended range is only about 10 meters. Um, and yeah, and so you get this categorization of a, a personal area network from that. Um, version two increased uh, the data rate up to 2.1 megabits, uh, but overall the focus of Bluetooth is low power uh, and this kind of you know uh, consumer device interaction kind of uh, arrangement. So um, the Bluetooth Special Interest Group defined Bluetooth. Um, generally speaking, the interoperability testing seems to lag behind that of Wi-Fi and that you tend to get much more difficulty with interoperability between different brands of Bluetooth equipment. Um, each Bluetooth device will 
uh, implement a set of uh, protocols um, above the link layer to define what application protocols it can uh, support. So for example, a, um, a set of Bluetooth headphones might only support uh, the audio uh, sync profile, uh, whereas a headset that has a microphone as well will have separate profiles taking the, the microphone into account. Uh, and there are others about uh, relaying access uh, to internet connectivity, uh, synchronizing PDA data, quite a variety of profiles, uh, really. And again, this is on a, it's a layered network model uh, there for that. Um, Bluetooth also supports a very simple ad hoc kind of setup uh, called a PicoNet, which can have up to eight devices, but one of them is effectively the master of it. So it's not a true peer-to-peer -peer ad hoc network, uh, which limits its uh, ability because the slaves can't correct directly connect with one another. Uh, and so this doesn't scale in the same way. Uh, in order to keep within the seven uh, slave device limit, uh, a master can park a slave for a time uh, so that it can communicate with others and so that we can save power for the, um, uh, the park slaves. So um, again, if we look at a, um, a Bluetooth Picanet, uh, you might have the master, which might be your laptop, or maybe it might actually be your phone, uh, it's more likely now as well. And then it can be directly connected um, to up to seven devices. And some of those might be in active communications and the others can be parked uh, to communicate with later. Um, so at the, the other end of things, um, so Bluetooth, of course, is very uh, short range and relatively low bandwidth. Um, now we're seeing more uh, wireless uh, approaches for connecting to uh, the internet uh, in different ways. So cellular networks, obviously, uh, are a, um, uh, a much uh, larger part of the, the mix these days. Uh, but also in terms of cabled approaches, so passive optical networks that deliver fiber to the home or curb or a distribution point nearby um, and allow efficient connecting. So when we say efficient here, we actually mean cost efficient in that the, um, the passive optical networks have a, a passive uh, data takeoff that works uh, in some cases by having a tight bend in the cable so that uh, some light leaks out uh, due to refractive index. Um, cellular networks, of course, have uh, evolved from being really based around phone calls and then a bit and um, text as well over time. And now, uh, you know, from 4G onwards, they're actually they're a data network that provides high quality voice calls over the top. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, the, all the, the issues around efficient use of spectrum as a limited resource uh, still come into play. Uh, 5G. Uh, looks to improve so well if we go back for a moment so 2g networks of course were kind of the the first uh digital cellular networks so that was the g refers to generation so it was the second generation the first generation were purely analog uh and so uh, it was effectively uh you know uh, a two-way radio system that had support for cell towers uh, to relay communications between devices and connect to the the wider phone network but your voice calls actually just went as analog audio uh, over the, um, uh, the air. So you could listen into people's analog phone calls. Uh, this caused embarrassment at various points in the 80s and 90s. Uh, then we moved to 2G, which was digital networks, um, very slow data rates, uh, very limited other services. Uh, 3G added at the time decent data rates of around one megabit per second. Um, 4G added higher data rates and much better masking of packet loss. So 3G internet, even when you had it, um, and at the highest speeds that it could offer, uh, particularly the sort of the three and a half G networks that would allow up to eight or 10 megabits per second, uh, was still actually often quite annoying to use due to a combination of latency and unmasked packet loss. Uh, that meant that you know, connections would time out and you'd have to restart them and things, and it was quite frustrating. So 4G dealt with that problem um, but you still have latency uh, and bandwidth limitations compared to, for example, a, a home uh, you know, a fiber connection, for example. And so 5G is trying to solve that uh, speed problem and also to further reduce the latency to be at least as competitive as uh, the home fiber uh, kind of setups. And so all of these technologies that get used for access to 
uh, internet type services are often called access networks because they're about providing that last uh, kilometre or so uh, or few kilometres uh, to connect uh, to the internet. Um, and what we see is that those technologies, because of the, the massive consumer demand uh, and the use cases that they enable, uh, that that's evolving faster than the core networks are uh, in general. Um, and in order to provide these services, and like with 5G, to get the latency down, um, you effectively end up with a lot of what used to be in the centre of the network now happening uh, much nearer out to the edge. Um, so you know, these networks are getting their own clusters of compute and resources that can be coordinated in different ways. So in effect, you're kind of getting some of these same uh, you know, aspects of uh, cloud uh, in terms of the, the abstraction of network and location of network resources. And this is all really kind of, for 5G in particular, becoming uh, possible uh, because you know, the commoditization of hardware, virtualization of hardware supports this new spectrum so that you can get the higher data rates uh, without having to give up the old networks uh, by, to release their spectrum. Uh, and the separation of software from hardware that makes it much easier to uh, to do software defined innovation uh, of things. And so this is creating all sorts of new opportunities. I mean, the Internet of Things is one uh, possible part of that. Um, but th there's lots of things we're having, you know, reduced latency uh, and higher data rates make it much more compelling or where it makes uh, cellular communications uh, competitive uh, or the uh, the best option compared to some of the other access uh, technologies that were previously used. Okay, so we've looked in this chapter at a whole bunch of different link types of the, the broad families of, uh, you know, of wired and wireless uh, and how we actually transfer data over these kinds of things. So, you know, we've had to look at uh, the encoding uh, of binary data. And then once we've got bits, instead of analog wiggly lines, uh, how we actually form frames out of that. Uh, how we can detect when errors inevitably will occur, uh, how we can create reliable data streams over that, and how we can do efficient uh, multiple access, so the sharing of a link amongst multiple users. Oops. And that is the end of uh, the chapter. So hopefully that has been uh, a good introduction for you uh, to think about these kinds of different issues and think about uh, you know, what technology do you need to solve a particular uh, need? It's going to depend on uh, the properties of the problem, the, you know, the, where the, uh, the locations are that need to communicate with one another, for example. Uh, and hopefully you now have a, a number of the tools to help you uh, analyze and think about uh, those networks uh, and the, the different factors at play as to, to which one might or which ones might be better or worse than others uh, or what the trade-offs would be uh, in those different situations. So thank you and we'll see you in the next chapter.